All right. If you have a Bible with you today, I want to invite you to find the letter of Galatians. All right, the letter of Galatians. We are starting a new series that we'll be in for a little while here. This is going to kind of be a little bit of like our summer series. I don't know if it'll carry us all the way through the summer, uh, but we are going through the letter of Galatians. Okay, and now last year, uh, during the summer, we went through the letter of Ephesians. All right, and this is just kind of, uh, I, I love doing that. I love taking an extended period of time and focusing in on God's word and kind of slowing down uh, and just kind of really uh, allowing God to speak to us through his word. And so I think it's just important to kind of remember uh, w- that each one of these letters has context to it, right? Like you may be, at, uh, we're going to read through Galatians today and you might hear verses, you're like, I've heard that verse before. But when you hear it inside the context of the entire message, you might be like, oh, I didn't realize that that's what that meant. And I think there's a lot of people in our world that they reach a spot where they feel like, ah, I just, I just don't know if the Bible's true. You know, there's all these verses and this, and, and it just it hasn't rang true in my life. And, and the reality is because they're like, well, you know, I read Philippians 4, and it says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And then I went out and tried to run a marathon, and I failed. And you're like, yep, because that verse didn't talk about running a marathon, <laughs> right? Like we just, we like to take little individual verses and apply them to whatever's going on in our life. Uh, but when we do that, and I, I want to like say this in the right way, like we, we can find encouragement in any one of these verses. And there can be truth that actually does um, even transcend just kind of the context of those moments. But we do set ourselves up in a spot where we can all of a sudden allow scripture to feel like it's untruthful or that it's lying to us when in fact we are trying to make it say something that it never intended to say. And that's actually where the failure is happening. And so we're just going to slow down. We're going to go through the letter of Galatians. Uh, This, like many of the New Testament uh, letters, was written to a specific, actually a few specific churches, specific communities, uh, who were dealing and facing specific issues. All right, and we forget that a lot. You're going to hear me say this multiple times this morning. Okay, like all of that we have to keep in mind that this was written to a certain group of people. Like remember, the Bible was not written to you. The Bible was written for you, but it was not written to you. And that may seem like I'm splitting hairs, but it's, it's actually an incredibly important distinction. And so we're going to kind of go through this, and I'm excited as we start this today. Uh, I would love for us to just come with kind of an attitude of wanting to grow, of wanting to hear from God, of wanting to be challenged. And so I'd love to start our time off this morning just with praying. So if you are willing, if you're able, would you stand with me? Uh, I just want to kind of open us in prayer as we jump into this today. God, we are thankful that we can gather together in community, Lord, that for so many of us, we, we do feel like we have found this, uh, this place where we can come and we can be transparent, we can be vulnerable, we can, um, we can share what's going on, we can be encouraged by people around us. But God, more than that, that we can come together and just with, with one mind, we can focus on you. And so God, we just pray this morning uh, that as we do this, that we would be challenged, that things would just jump off the page to us in a way that they haven't before. God, in a way that would change the way that we live this week. Lord, so that we can represent you better and better. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen. You can have a seat. Uh, Last year, as we went through the letter to the Ephesians, uh, the very first week in the series, uh, we did something kind of interesting where I'm like, hey, we're starting the letter of Ephesians, but we actually did not even open it up. I spent the first week of that series, if anyone was here, you might remember this, actually talking about what does it look like, what did it look like for a letter to be written in the first century world. All right, and that may not be a question that many of us have asked before. Uh, Maybe we have an idea of how our Bible came about, like uh, whether you uh, probably didn't believe this, but sometimes I think we almost have this idea that like all of a sudden the clouds parted and this like single book just like floated down slowly in a beam of light and like landed and we're like, oh, the Bible. And like that, that's not really how this came about. And so uh, these were letters that were written, like I said, from a specific person to a specific group or somewhat generalized but still specific group and addressing 
certain issues that were going on. And as these letters were written, things we don't think about, it was actually incredibly expensive for these letters to be written, the letters that we have in the Bible. Because I think I often used to think that, that Paul must have sat down and in, a, in a fury that was motivated by like the Spirit, sits down and just whips out this nice long letter that's like amazing. And he's like, look at this, now let's send it. That's not really how it happened. Most often, there was actually a group that were writing a letter together, and they were pulling in ideas they'd already been talking about. And there was someone else, a scribe, who was maybe putting those ideas together into a letter. And they're writing multiple drafts, and every one of these drafts costs money. And so this was ex- expensive. It, it took a while. You know, there, there was quite a few people that were involved in the process of just even writing the letter and putting it together and then actually sending it along with a carrier to somebody. There are things like, uh, and I can't remember if we talked about this or not, but I'll have a, a table behind me that talks about like how long Paul's letters were compared to a lot of letters of that time. We have other kind of uh, famous letter writers of that time, and you'll see Paul's letters were significantly longer. Significantly longer. And I'm not going to rehash everything about what letter writing looked like at that time, but I, I will say this, it... It absolutely changed the way that I view. It did not in any way diminish the authority that I view in Scripture. But it changed the way that I approach some of these letters and how I try to actually like discern what God is speaking through them. And so if you weren't here for that, um, I would encourage you to go back, find our series on Ephesians. The very first message in it last summer uh, is going to talk about letter writing. We will actually, even in the video for this message, we will link um, the, the message from the start of Ephesians, if that's an easier way for you to find it. Uh, but I would encourage you guys to kind of go back uh, and look at this. All right, Because I just realized how many false ideas I kind of held just out of ignorance, not out of anything bad or anything like that, just purely out of ignorance surrounding some of these uh, letters and how they came about. And so this letter, the letter to uh, Galatia, was most likely the, the very first letter that Paul wrote all right, to, to any of the churches or believers that he had done. And he is writing it not just to one church, but it's actually to be circulated among the churches in the area of Galatia. All right, you can read about when Paul planted these churches in this area, visited these towns in Acts 13 and Acts 14. Okay, because maybe you didn't know this, but you have the book of Acts. It talks about the, the beginning of the church and what happened. The remainder of the New Testament after that, almost all of it, can basically be dropped into, chronologically, the book of Acts at various times, where Paul is on these journeys, but he's writing letters to churches that he previously planted. And so the letter to Galatia, for several reasons, is thought to probably be one of the first letters uh, that Paul writes. Now, Galatia has both an ethnic area and a, uh, and that's a smaller, more northern area where you have the Gaul people from Europe, all right, and they kind of spread over this whole area, but there was primarily concentrated there. And then you had a um, more, less of an ethnic and more of like political Galatia. And so that may not make sense to us today with our modern countries where we have like borders really easily defined. Uh, But essentially, like when I just went to the Balkan uh, Peninsula and I was in Albania, like Albania has its modern borders of the country. But as you drive into every one of the countries around it, for the first hundred miles as you drive into that, it is going to be purely Albanian people. Because the people group has a different border than what the political country has. And so that's kind of what's going on here. This letter is probably written to uh, more of the, um, the political area of Galatia because the churches that Paul had planted in Acts 13 and 14 are in the southern parts, away from kind of the ethnic area of, of the Gaul people. And so uh, this, the, the background of this letter is pretty important for us uh, as well. Um, these letters weren't Paul just trying to lay out big theological ideas for the future of the church in thousands of years. He did not sit down and say, here is what everybody should believe from here on out. We are actually, we, like, we are looking in on correspondence, and then today in our modern world as churches, as denominations, as whatever you want to call it, we are looking at these and we are trying to come up with like, what is our theology? What do we think is kind of correct here based off the Bible? 
But when you're doing that, looking at correspondence, you can see why various churches might come up with different ideas of what they believe. Right? Because they're like, well, I read the letter that Paul wrote to Galatia, and I, I feel like this is kind of what he's saying there. And we're trying to take something out of this correspondence and put it into theology today. It's what we have to do. But it's why we have so many differing kind of beliefs even within Christianity. It's not because the Bible is inaccurate. It's not because people are just always twisting things to be whatever they want it to be. People have good motives. They, they want to believe what they're supposed to believe. Uh, but that's just not how this is laid out. It's a specific letter from a specific person to a specific group of people about specific issues. All right, and I'm going to keep saying that. I'm going to keep saying that through this series because we have to remember that, that we are not the original recipients and we have to understand that in these letters. So the main issue at hand, the main issue in this whole letter is uh, sometime after Paul and Barnabas planted these churches in this area, other people came along who were followers of Christ who were of Jewish background, to these Gentile believers. Gentile simply means they aren't Jewish. All right, it's everybody else. According to like the Jewish people, there are two groups of people in the world. Jewish people and Gentiles. Everyone else is just Gentiles. Jewish believers came along to these Gentiles and said, hey, um, actually, you need to be following some of the same laws and customs that we follow. If you want to be part of the family of God, you need to do this. All right. Now, here's the difficult thing. They, they mainly were focused in on circumcision because that was the main sign of the Old Covenant, that you were part of the people of God. And so this is what they're kind of focusing in on. Now, oftentimes we think, and this, this is accurate, we think it was just theological, their reason for it. They're saying, listen, you can't be part of the family of God without doing this. Because when you read through the laws, that's what this says. But more than likely, this actually was more than just theological. There was kind of, I'm going to call it political, like leanings behind this. But in our world, that political has such like a different tone to that word. Essentially, what's happening here is this. At that time, everything is the Roman Empire. All right, And, the, and Rome does not put up with uprisings and rebellions and people doing things their own way. Now, somewhere along the line, the Jewish people were able to kind of get this like slight exclusion where Rome said, okay, to pacify you, you don't have to pray to Caesar as God. That's what all the Roman Empire did. But you don't have to pray to Caesar. You just have to pray for Caesar. We're going to give you this little exclusion to the Jewish people. Now you have this Christian community who wants to kind of claim that same exclusion. But if Rome were to come in and say, eh, I don't know, we gave it to that group of people. Are you part of that group of people? Well, they could kind of say, yeah, we are. We are a continuation. We believe that the Messiah is coming, which Rome is not going to understand. What they're going to understand is, listen, that group of people, they have a, they have a way of knowing who they are. And it's circumcision. And you don't have that. You're not part of that group of people. And so these Jewish believers that are coming, there's a very good chance that they are likely trying to keep Rome happy and saying, listen, we can't have you guys ruining this for everybody else. Okay, they also are more than likely coming from Jerusalem because it says they were friends of James. James is leading the church in Jerusalem. And so James has a semi-good relationship with the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, they aren't killing each other. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's their good relationship. And he's like, listen, we can't make them mad either. And they're kind of happy that we're continuing to follow some of these rules. And so you have this multiple layered thing going on here. We don't know exactly why. They don't come flat out and say why. The word salvation or saved is, is found nowhere in Galatians, which is often what we think this is. But there's, there's multiple layers to what's happening here. Uh, all this is important for us to kind of remember as we're going into this. And, and Paul uses this letter to basically flip out and be like, this is not okay. I preach to you the gospel. Someone else is coming along and they are changing it. They are adding to it. 
and that's not okay. And you need to go back to what I have taught you. And so this whole letter is him kind of going through this in various ways. Now, oftentimes when you talk about what is the book of Galatians about, you'll hear someone say, well, it's about justification, you know, being made right with God, either through works, following the law, or through faith, just, you know, believing in Jesus. But that kind of oversimplifies it a little bit. I think a better kind of all-encompassing idea is that what Galatians is about is about identity. It's about who are the people of God and how can you tell that they are the people of God. And so it comes into this idea of law versus not law. Yeah, that's part of it. But there's more to it than that. Paul would say, you are Messiah people. You are followers of the Messiah who are transformed by the Spirit. That's where your transformation comes. Your transformation does not come by being obedient to the law because you can't do it. You will never fulfill that. And so trying to do that actually negates what Jesus did for us. This is kind of the whole message. And this is the way it would have been first heard. It really is the way that it was... Uh, uh, so, oh, Sorry, here's what we're going to do today. We, we are going to read all of Galatians. I'm going to read it for us, start to finish. And we did this at the end of the series for Ephesians. All right, and we said this. We said, this is how the letter was meant to be heard. This is how the first people would have heard it. They would have been gathered together, and someone would have came in and said, hey, I have a letter. It's from Paul. And this being the first letter, they're probably like, oh, I don't know. Maybe this is a good letter. I think churches down the road, they're like, oh, no. <laughs> we got a letter from Paul. <laughs> oh, man, we screwed up. But at this point, they're like, okay. And so someone would have came in. They would have read the entire letter start to finish. Now, part of the reason why we think that this is one of the first letters, this one, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and then actually a letter to the church in Corinth that we don't have that would be prior to 1 Corinthians. That may mess with some of your guys' ideas right now even. I'm telling you, like, the idea of letters is, is crazy. Go back and listen to that message. Those four letters are thought to maybe be the first ones. Because Paul did not name who he sent the letter with. And, and so what we think is that he basically just kind of sent it with someone that he trusted. But they delivered the letter. They said it. And that was the extent of their job. Because those four letters are thought to basically have been pretty misunderstood by the churches that received them. And that there was a lot of issues following that. Now later on, as he continues to write letters, you will see him talk about the person who is carrying the letter, and the person who carried the letter then would often get up, read the letter, expound on the letter, answer questions about the letter, because they were probably even part of writing the letter. They were part of that small group that was putting this all together, writing this, so they could be like, hey, I know what Paul would say here. And so Paul is sending his authority with them as like a messenger. And so, in this letter, we don't have that. And so, it was thought that this letter did kind of cause some issues. It was misunderstood in different ways. All right? And so, uh, I, I'm excited to just read this. And you might be like, this is kind of crazy. That's a lot. Yeah, it's going to be 20 minutes. The next 20 minutes is going to be me reading this. All right? And I have water, which I didn't have first service. Uh, so, I got water this service. All right? So, hopefully, I can kind of like keep going here. Um, chapters, verses, all of that, that was all added later. So I'm going to read this just straight through. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. The reason for that is this. New Living, uh, there's a lot of different translations of the Bible. It is on what's called the thought-for-thought thought interpretation, which means they took an entire sentence or an entire thought, read it in the original language, and then translated it into our language, trying to accomplish that same thought. Versus what would be called a word for word, where they really take each word and translate it. Word for word is great for studying at what was Paul really trying to say here, but it's very difficult to read and understand always in like large chunks. So we're going to read thought for thought. That may not be the translation we use as we go through this this summer, uh, but that's where I'm going to kind of read with this. All right? And so what we're going to see here as I read through this, kind of a, a very rough outline. Paul's going to talk about the gospel, talk about the, what the true gospel is. All right. Uh, he is going to talk about how he was commissioned by Jesus 
Because what might happen here is people might say, yeah, but that guy, they, they came from the church in Jerusalem. That's a big deal. Like, that's headquarters, national office. Like, they probably know better than Paul. And Paul's like, no, listen, I was commissioned by Jesus himself. This is where my authority comes from. So we're going to hear him talk about that. Uh, we are going to hear him talk about a massive disagreement that strengthens his argument here that he had with the apostle Peter. All right, so he's going to talk about that. And then ultimately, he begins to talk about, listen, it's not by following the law that we are identified as God's people. It's by being transformed by the Spirit. That's how we are identified as God's people. All right, so this is kind of the whole letter here. I'm going to read this through. I'm going to switch over to a Bible app here. Um, got to go back to the beginning. And so here's what I'd want from you. It's not going to be on the screen. If you don't have a Bible with, that's fine. Actually, if you have a Bible with, if you want to follow along, you can. But this may be a good opportunity, actually, to maybe not even follow along. Maybe just to sit back. Feel free to close your eyes if you want, if you got sufficient sleep last night. If you didn't, maybe keep them open. All right? Um, or have someone close by that can give you a good jab if you start to snore. All right? So I'm going to read through this. Um, and you can follow along, or maybe you want to just kind of sit back and, and sit here imagining that you are receiving this letter. Imagine that we are a community that is dysfunctional. All right, you don't have to imagine very hard. Because I'll let you know a secret, we are a community, and we are dysfunctional. All right, so um, this letter is just coming to a community, and they're, they're like, okay, I, I want to hear this. And so this is where we're going to go. I'm going to take a drink of water, and we're going to jump in. This letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority, but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. All the brothers and sisters here join me in sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. May God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God, who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again what we have said before. If anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. I receive my message from no human source, and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. You know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away into Arabia and later returned to the city of Damascus. Then three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter, and I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. I declare before God that what I am writing to you is not a lie. After that visit, I went north into the provinces of Syria and Cilicia, and still the churches in Christ that are in Judea didn't know me personally. All they knew was that people were saying, the one who used to persecute us is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy, and they praised God because of me. Then, 14 years later, I went back to Jerusalem again. This time with Barnabas and Titus came along too. I went there because God revealed to me that I should go. 
While I was there, I met privately with those considered to be leaders of the church and shared with them the message I had been preaching to the Gentiles. I wanted to make sure that we were in agreement for fear that all my efforts had been wasted and I was running the race for nothing. And they supported me and did not even demand that my companion Titus be circumcised, though he was a Gentile. Even that question came up only because of some so-called believers there, false ones really, who were secretly brought in. They sneaked in to spy on us and take away the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. They wanted to enslave us and force us to follow their Jewish regulations. But we refused to give in to them for a single moment. We wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel message for you. And the leaders of the church had nothing to add to what I was preaching. By the way, their reputation as great leaders made no difference to me, for God has no favorites. Instead, they saw that God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. For the same God who worked through Peter as the apostle to the Jews also worked through me as the apostle to the Gentiles. In fact, James, Peter, and John, who are known as pillars of the church, recognized the gift God had given me, and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles. While they continued their work with the Jews, their only suggestion was that we keep on helping the poor, which I have always been eager to do. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterwards, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, Since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are both Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet, we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And, when, and we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty because we have abandoned the law. What would that mean? Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of law I already tore down. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all of its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there is no need for Christ to die. O foolish, Gentile, o foolish Gal, Gal, Galatians, sorry. O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. In the same way, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures look forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, All nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commandments that are written in God's book of the law. 
So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. This way of faith is very different from the way of law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Dear brothers and sisters, here's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. God gave the promises to Abraham and his child, and notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children, as if meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child, and that, of course, means Christ. This is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Now a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scripture Scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin, so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that do not ex even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? You are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years. I fear for you. Perhaps all my hard work with you is for nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things. For I have become, like you Gentiles, free from those laws. You did not mistreat me when I first preached to you. Surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn me away. No, you took me in and cared for me as though I were an angel from God or even Christ Jesus himself. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? I am sure you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it had been possible. Have I now become your enemy because I am telling you the truth? Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They are trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. 
If someone is eager to do good things for you, that's all right, but let them do it all the time, not just when I'm with you. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I wish I were with you right now so I could change my tone, but at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. Tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of his slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai where people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia because she and her children live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. As Isaiah said, Rejoice, O childless woman, you who have never given birth. Break into a joyful shout, you who have never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. But you are now being persecuted by those who want to keep the law, just like Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. But what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, we are children of the free woman. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you are trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. You are running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. I am trusting the Lord to keep you from believing false teachings. God will judge that person, whoever he is, who has been confusing you. Dear brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that you must be circumcised, as some say I do, why am I still being persecuted? If I were no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, no one would be offended. I just wish that those troublemakers who want to mutilate you by circumcision would mutilate themselves. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. Don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out, beware of destroying one another. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. 
Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from the sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. And even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want you to be circumcised so they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. It does, doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. From now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Worship team, would you guys come? Why don't we stand? Public reading of scripture like that is actually has played a massive role in the followers of God throughout all of history. And we, we just, we don't do it enough where we sit and we read large portions of scripture. Actually, if you go back and look, like this is often when, when the people of God would become distracted and then when they were off focus, there would be moments where someone would then read through scripture and, and not just this, we're talking like the entire Torah, like start like just crazy amounts. You know, you can think of like uh, King Josiah actually, when, he, when they had lost the law and they were living their own way and all of a sudden he finds it and he gathers the people and they read it and it just results in this massive like, wow, when we see the big picture of all of this, I, I want to live that way. And I know for me, as I read through large portions of scripture, like I see verses and I'm like, man, I've taken that verse before and I've kind of used it to mean this in my life. And that just isn't really what's happening here, I guess. And it's so good to hear these. And the key question that this letter, when you read the whole letter, when you hear it all at once, the key question that this is dealing with is who are God's people and how do you know that? Because it used to be God's people were the Israelites, God's people were the Jewish people, and you knew it by the sign of the covenant, circumcision. And Paul's saying, listen, we know God's people and it's not just the Jewish or, or Israelites, like it's a multi-ethnic family. It's for everybody, all the way back. This is what was promised to Abraham. And we can identify them, not by a physical sign like circumcision, but by a change in the heart that the Spirit can do. By the love that they have for people, by the fruits of the Spirit. This is how, this is, now how we see this and this is this beautiful picture that's laid out 
And I think this is so relevant for our broken and fractured world today, okay? Let me read something that one of my favorite commentators kind of wrote about just the letter of Galatians as a whole. He says, the most powerful statement our churches can make amid conflicts of class, tribe, and race must be made through the actual coming together of believers of all types in a united worshiping family. The single greatest sign that God's kingdom has taken root in a skeptical and suspicious world is that the church, in all of its manifold diversities, comes together, eating at the same table, announcing one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and worshiping with one voice. Understand that our world needs this. Our world needs a church that is not creating more division and more fractions, but is saying, listen, we are coming together. And there's one thing that draws us together that is far greater than every other difference we have. When Paul says in this letter, you know, there's no more uh, man or woman or Jew or Gentile or slave or free. He's not saying that there actually isn't. Obviously there is. He's saying, listen, all of that is a distant second to what draws us together as one community. Yesterday, I was spending time making the, the graphic for this series. And most of the time, I'm gonna be honest, these are just like stupid little things to put on the screen behind us, okay? And there's just like not a whole lot to it or anything like that. And, uh, this one though, as I was putting this together, like there's a little bit of actually an idea that I, I tried to put into this. And I'm not always the, the best at these things. Pastor Carson at our Sox Center Church, he's so good at this. But, but what I have here is this idea of, you can see this like center box that has these, these boundaries and these borders and, and kind of this stuff that is, um, that, is, that is holding all of this in. And then you have this beautiful like color around it and you have this dove, which often is, is symbolic of the spirit, breaking out of this box and into this life of just color. And I think with, with so many things, like where, where I know that this, this letter is going to help so many of us, is we forget how often legalism and rules and, and all sorts of things like that find their way back into our life. Now, there, there is good, there, there's good places to have just like some, some personal rules and some ideas in your life of like, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that. But when we start to live by that, when we live and we die by that, when we start to place that on other people and say, they aren't living their life by my rules, so they must not be a good Christian because my rules is what it means to be a good Christian. Like that, that is, you are being a slave to the law is what Paul would say. What point did Jesus have then? And so I, I'm excited for us to dive into this and to let us really just let this shape our walk with Jesus in a new way as we go through this. And so uh, here's my challenge for you guys. As we go through this series, which is going to be the next weeks, months here, I'm not, I'm not positive. We haven't mapped the full thing out. It's going to kind of be our summer series though. I want to challenge you to spend time reading through the letter of Galatians. I, I'm part of a, a, something with the Bible Project where they're going through the Sermon on the Mount over the entire year this year. And we are rereading the same thing over and over and over and over every single week and doing it at fast paces, slow paces. My challenge for us with this letter to Galatians, every week, find a way to read through Galatians. One of the weeks, sit down and read it through start to finish. 20 minutes. The next week, maybe have someone read it out loud. Use the Bible app and click play and listen to it. The next week, read it one chapter a day. There's six chapters. Break it down, whatever that would look like, but spend time and, and understand you're probably not going to get it every week, but shoot for that. Spend time going through this letter. And at the end of this time, I, I, I believe this is going to be a totally different letter for us in the way that we, we, we see this and the way it impacts our lives and how it changes us. And so I want to do this. I want to close in prayer. Our prayer team is going to be up front, in the back. If you have anything that you need prayer for, I want to encourage you, go to one of the prayer team members. All right, you can say what it is. Or you can just say, hey, I just want prayer. I want someone to come alongside me right now. 
I'm going to stand in the gap and pray for someone else in my family, pray for someone else at work, pray for something that is happening in my life, whatever that would look like. All right, but we're just going to kind of close this with one song together. And I love even that, that quote of just like one body coming together and us closing by singing one song together. And so maybe you don't even like to sing. Maybe that's not your thing. I want to challenge you. It's the worst that's going to happen here. Even sing quietly. Take a step over if you're worried about your neighbor's ears or something, all right? Like whatever it is. But let's just, let's lift one voice together as one community. And so let's, let's just kind of respond in that way today. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is enough. We don't have to spice it up with illustrations and stories and all these things to make it powerful. It is powerful on its own. And we just thank you for that. We thank you that we have the ability to gather together in this community, read this, hear this together, proclaim this over our lives. And so God, we just pray that even over the next weeks and months here, Lord, that you would have your way in our life. Challenge us, change us. We ask this in your name. Amen.